Hello, community. While everybody knows what a warehouse is and SQL, I received a lot of questions about a light lake house and Spark. So let's have a look at this. We're going to run about a database, a tabular example, a data warehouse, the ETL process, batch and streaming. We move on to the, delt, to the data lake, to proprietary warehouses, to Google's BigQuery, Big Lake, Iceberg version 1, and then we switch to Delta Lake, Spark, ETL, Parquet, Unified Catalog, Structured Streaming. And then we have the architecture of the lake house. So this is the content of my talk. And to make it a little bit more challenging, think about it. Technology is only of value if it provides value to the user. So everybody can explain this in high tech terms, but let's do something. Let's explain it 4,000 years ago in old Egypt. Imagine I am a writer here. I'm responsible for the logistics of building some beautiful pyramids here for the pharaoh. And let's have this scenario and let's go and try to explain the background why we have from a data warehouse to a delta lake and a lake house. So here we go. Now, the task is easy. Build for the pharaoh some pyramids. pyramids. We need some stones from the quarry. Here we have two quarries, and we have a lot of ships in the Nile and in the ocean that provide us with further material. Now, first task is, of course, we here have to register how many stones are produced. Easy. Right at the quarry, they say, hey, today we produce two stones, and tomorrow we have four stones on our list. So this is a presentation in a table of form. It is a table, you have rows, you have columns. This is a two-dimensional representation of the data that you can put here in a database or the old Egyptian might have called it some, you put the papyrus somewhere here on the table and this is it. And you do this for both queries, you see, and when you have those queries, you have created a database with the local data. Beautiful. Now, next up. Of course, we do this everywhere, and we have everywhere a tabular data format. So this means we have rows and columns everywhere. Now, may I introduce you a nice little guy. His name is ETL, and it stands for Extraction, Transformation, and Loading. Now, extraction is easy. It is the process of retrieving data from one source, and then, after the retrieval or the extraction, the data is loaded to a staging area. Now, in the middle, we have the interesting part, the cleaning part. Now, transformation involves taking the data, cleaning it, putting it in a common format. So, if we have this example with my papyrus, where I have the table, if there's some data missing, I ask for the missing data, and then I have a beautiful common format and it can be stored in a targeted database, a data warehouse, a data lake. And cleaning also involves taking out duplicate or incomplete records. Now, and then we have to transport it somewhere where we load it up. And loading is the process of inserting that formatted, cleaned data now into a target database or a data warehouse. And this is exactly what we're going to do. So here we go. You see, I'm sitting here very comfortably and I'm building a warehouse. Now the warehouse has the function to collect all the data information from all the local producers, from all the local databases. And you might ask, how do I collect the data? Well, it is easy. I have my ETL process. So, I have here my little guy and he collects all the tabular data, the papyrus if you want, this two-dimensional data representation with rows and columns, and they all bring it to the warehouse. And next one I want to show you. Oh yeah, and there are two ways I can collect it. Now the classical way is batch. Batch is easy. Whenever ETL comes here, he sees here on our shelf, there are two, three, four, five papyrus where we have all this information. So he takes a batch of those papyrus, four, five, six, seven, ten papyrus, papyri, as the Greek would call it, but they are not yet here for another 1,000 years. 
and he brings it on a batch here back to the warehouse. Now, of course, you know that there's other possibility now. You could stream events. Now, this is not really with the classical warehouse, but today, with our evolution, we have warehouses that expect streamed events. Kafka maybe is familiar to you. So whenever a ship arrives here, they send, I don't know, in old Egypt, they send a bird. And the bird flew there and said, hey, here's the data. And whenever a ship arrives, the bird is released. And we don't have to wait for our ETL to come and batch up the information and bring it back to the warehouse. So we have here batch processing and stream processing, or maybe you're familiar with Kafka. So here in the warehouse, now you see, I have here the data for my four databases. I have my four ETL processes that provided the data to me. And for the first database, I sizzled it into stone. Beautiful. It has a fixed structure. Now for the red database, I sizzled it into stone. Beautiful. Now you see now immediately what's the difference between a database and a data warehouse. A database is there to capture and record the data. The data is stored in tables, in rows and in columns. It's flexible, the schema. And we have a process online transactional processing. A data warehouse is designed to analyze data, current data, historical data, and the processing is called an online analytical processing. But we have here a fixed schema. So this is not flexible in the classical data warehouse. And of course, as I showed you, the ETL process is here to bring in the data from the other local databases here in Egypt. Now time passed by and we found some innovative new approaches. Welcome to the data lake. Now what is a data lake? Easy. Normally, you just have tabular data, rows and columns, two-dimensional data. But then they started to have here these pictures and color, a three-channel uh, RGB. We have three color channels, a picture now. And then, as you can see here, they suddenly here with this black and white figure of the pharaoh, we have text or we have hieroglyphs that are not in tabular data, that are just pure and simple text, linear text, for example. Or if you look here at this picture and this picture and this picture, and if you move very fast with your head over the picture, you have something like a movie effect. So you can store photos, you can store plain text, you can store uh, audio files, you can store video files, you can store tabular data, whatever. People dumped everything in the data lake. And then, of course, you have to have an ETL process to extract relevant data, prepare them for analysis in the warehouse. So even with a data lake, we have still the warehouse architecture going on because there is a specific functionality. And if you look at modern literature, this is the picture you would see. You have here the data lake, which is here my blue lake. Then we have the database, we have the photos, we have the videos, we have the audio files, we have the unstructured uh, raw text files, semi-structured, unstructured, structured data, everything is in the data lake. And then if you want to have business intelligence and, and reporting to your CTO, CFO, CEO, whatever, you have still the data warehouses where you have the ETL process that extracts the relevant data from the data lake. Now, you know that, okay, for the first pyramid, it's okay. But if you build a second pyramid, we have knowledge. What we want to have, we want to predict how many stones we need if we build it a little bit taller or a little bit smaller, the pyramid. So we have something like data science coming up and machine learning. We want to do some prediction based on the data that we have in our company. You see here, you have the data pipelines, the data connectivity right down to the data lake. Now, in the data lake, it was not the perfect situation. So you see the emergence of data science and machine learning right next to the typical data analytical task that you are familiar with. So here we go. What happened was data warehouses with their non-flexible structure in a classical way, now they were replicated for every job. Marketing had a data warehouse, sales had a data warehouse, public relation had a data warehouse, everybody had a data warehouse, everybody extracted some kind of data 
with a specific date from a specific combination of data out of the data lake and everybody built its own analytical engine in the warehouse and nothing was compatible, cross-compatible at all and it was more or less a beautiful mess. So what is the solution, you might ask? Okay, within the warehouse we used a very specific query language, SQL, the Structured Query Language. As a great advantage combining data from multiple tables within a single database, you can do here the typical job of a data analyst, provide reports and so on. You created here a little bit more intelligent data pipelines from the data lake to the warehouse and now our little ETL guy becomes blue because he's swimming in all the data and there is a big pipeline connecting the data lake to our warehouse. And SQL was enough for the pure analytical part. But as I showed you, with the emergence of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, whatsoever, all the different discoveries we had, NLP, vision, whatever, there emerged a huge chunk of programs here were also relied on company data or data on a specific topic. So what happened? Those guys here, they built their own data pipeline so they can access all the data that are dumped in the data lake. Now, of course, for their models, for the ML task, for example, you need a complete different set of data from the data lake so they have a specific pipeline. And they don't use SQL because SQL is just a query language. But here we are in research, which it's really here a data scientist. So there's the typical R or Python or whatever your programming language is. So you see, suddenly you have these two branches emerging and everybody built its own uh, data pipeline or ETL pipeline. Because of course they had to clean the data And they were not sure it's always the latest data, it's a consolidated data. So it was a little bit of a mess. But what happened over time is that with the analytical team on SQL, they had insights, but of course only in insights of the data of the past. So they had retro insights. The challenge of the people here in machine learning was to build models that understand the connectivity into relation between parameters so that they could make predictions about the future, to create insights into the future. And of course, everybody wanted to have both. If you're a company, you want exactly have a deep dive in your historical data and you want to know what does your historical data tells you about your future data. So cloud providers started to combine this. And you know, we have three main cloud providers from Google Cloud, from AWS and Microsoft. So they started to fuse this all together. Let's have a look in detail at SQL at the data warehouse now in the cloud. Here we go. Under Pharaoh Google, (laughs) there was something here that is called a big query. And BigQuery is more or less a warehouse. If you're a data analyst, BigQuery and SQL would be your preferred tools to do some data analysis. BigQuery is, of course, evolved, and you, today you can do a lot of with BigQuery from Google in the cloud. For example, you have BigQuery machine learning, and it enables the data analyst, not just the data scientist, but the data analyst, to build and operationalize simple machine learning models. But using their language, using simple SQL, staying within their range. And of course, then they could export some ML models, only some specific models like linear regression models for some online prediction on Google's Google's Vertex AI. But also you had the beautiful uh, business intelligence engine, the BI engine, the classical analytical engine that there also is the job more or less of the data analyst. And then you had something beautiful, real-time analytics. And of course, you wanted to have your batch data, of course, but you also wanted to have the streaming data that came in 
every second, every hour, every day. So you want to have a beautiful uh, pipeline where you can integrate immediately and process on the streaming data. And all of this is beautiful and this is happening. And if you currently uh, looked at BigQuery in 2022, Google announced BigQuery, they have now something they call a big lake. And they have it to explore and unify different data types, govern data across the data lakes, the data warehouses, and consistent control. So you see, you can do ML with some models. You have a BI engine, you have streaming data, you have batch data, and you have also an evolution of the data lake. Now, those machine learning models, if you're a data scientist, you say, well, they can do in SQL machine learning. Well, of course, only restricted in a simple scenario, in a simple ecosystem. And here's everything you need to know. And the link, if you're interested, what you can do, machine learning in SQL. But if you are a data scientist, now we come to the main part. We have other tools. We have Spark, Scala, or PySpark if you're with Python. We have TensorFlow, we have PyTorch, we have JAX. And of course, it's all about big data and AI. So what happened? Under the new Faro Databricks, you know, databricks.com, they said, okay, listen, let's take away the typical classical warehouse concept with SQL. Let's integrate all of this into a new kind of architecture. And they decided, okay, what we are looking for, everybody still dumps everything in a data lake, but we have special ETL pipelines with Spark ETL. And we have the beautiful concept of Spark from Databricks. I think it was invented in Berkeley, University of Berkeley. I'm not quite sure, I have to check this. And you have here the beautiful combination of data and artificial intelligence. And they said, okay, listen, we are in the big data business. So we are talking about petabytes of data. What we want to have, we want to have a distributed, since we're working on, on a lot of compute clusters, we want to have a distributed SQL engine. We want to have here exploratory data analysis, and we want to have everything from AI and machine learning and everything here. So they said, okay, and for all the data scientists who already know R or Python, let's create PySpark as our language. Now, to know a little bit of what is PySpark in detail, it is in-memory processing to be fast. It is multi-cluster engine, so you can scale up to thousands of machines. You have a multi-language engine, I'll show you in a second. The task is data engineering. You can build pipelines, unbelievable complex structures. You are in data science, pure hardcore data science. You can build beautiful machine learning models. And something I use a lot, you can write the programs on single node machines like my laptop. And when I go in my company, you can scale it to a compute cluster in the cloud without any changes of the code. So this is also the reason why about 80% of the Fortune 500 companies in the US use Apache Spark from Databricks. Spark is trademark. There are four reasons I would like to show you. You have the unify of the processing of your data in real batches and real-time streaming. So what I showed you, the batches, two, three, four, five documents, or you stream it in real time. You can unify this. You have, if you're a data analyst, an advanced distributed SQL engine for large-scale data, everything you need, runs faster than the most warehouses because we are in the cloud and cluster-oriented. You can do data science at scale, and scale, I mean here, petabyte scale data. So this means 1024 terabytes is a petabyte. Or if you like to have a physical reference, it's a petabyte is about 500 billion pages of standard printed text. You can do on petabytes exploratory data analysis on the cluster real time, nice. And of course, everything about AI, machine learning, you write the code on a laptop and you can use the same code to scale to fault tolerant clusters of thousands of machines. And then as I told you, PySpark. Now this is the collaboration, the new uh, child of Apache Spark and Python. Scala, I, I used to, to do a little bit in Scala, 
but with PySpark, it is so much easier. I personally prefer PySpark. And Apache Spark is an open source cluster compute framework built around speed and streaming analytics. And of course, you know, good old Python 3 is a general purpose, high level program languages. So now you know what it is. And now finally, we can answer the question, what is a lake house? Now, a lake house was more or less invented by Databricks with the beautiful Spark ecosystem. And it looks like this. You have in the ground layer, you have your cloud data lake. So your data lake, but in the cloud, with unstructured and structured data, everything as you know, your data lake. Then you have another layer, and this is called by Databricks a delta lake. And I'll show you what it is in a second. We have then a Unity catalog for access control, security, and then you have every engine, data warehousing, data engineering, streaming, and data science, machine learning. But you have access to some unified data, batch, streaming, whatever. And there is some beautiful processing going on that ensures that you here, when you're working here, data science and AI, that you already have the data you are looking for. So let's look at this. I told you on the data lake, we have the delta lake now four sentences to the delta lake. The delta lake is an optimized storage layer that provides the foundation for storing the data and the tables in the Databricks Lakehouse platform. The delta lake is an open source software, yes, that extends the parquet data files with a file-based transaction log for asset transactions. I have a specific video on asset transaction. I'll leave you the link in the description. The Delta Lake is, of course, fully compatible with Apache Spark APIs, since done both by Databricks, for a tight integration with structured streaming. Structured streaming lets you express computation on streaming data in the same way you express a batch computation on your static data. So it performs the computation incrementally and continuously updates and it updates the result as the streaming data arrives. So everything is done in real time. You have your batch processing, you have your uh, uh, streaming pipeline coming in and the data are filled up and it's beautiful. You have absolute control. You can have a lot of operations that you know you have the correct data and there's only one ground roof data. Now, structured streaming is at the core it's the core technology at the heart of Databricks Autoloader. What is an autoloader? Easy in a jet supported file types from cloud object storage somewhere in the cloud into a Delta Lake. And for easy use, there's something now as a Delta Life Table, and this is used for our ETL pipelines. Databricks created the Delta Life Tables to reduce the complexity of building, deploying, and maintaining production of ETL pipelines. Now, if you're familiar with Apache Kafka, you can integrate this beautifully. Structured streaming can connect to message services such as Apache Kafka. So everything beautiful. I leave you here an HTTP link for your further information. Now, I want to show you how this is done. You might say, how complicated is it? Here's a simple code example. We configure an autoloader to ingest data from some data in the cloud into our Delta Lake. So what do you say? Spark, of course, we operate on a Spark ecosystem. Spark, read the stream format. We have here a JSON file or a CSV file or a parquet file or whatever file you like. And then you say, select, write the stream to the table. And it is, of course, a Delta Lake table by default. And to show you this, I have here two Jupyter notebooks. You can have here a look at the location I have here. Either you do it in Python. I would say if you're a data scientist, you do it in Python. If you're a data analyst, you do it in SQL. And you see also here in this advanced uh, Delta Lake and Lakehouse architecture, you have still SQL for the data analyst, for the industries. And you have Python, let's say, a little bit more orientated toward the data scientist. So everybody should have access, not, not exclusive. So two notebooks I'll show you provide Python and SQL examples 
to implement a Delta Live Table Pipeline. So we build a pipeline, and what should this pipeline do? Now, we take some raw data. We have here some JSON file or whatever CSV file, whatever you have, clickstream data into a table. Then we read the records from the raw data table and use Delta Live Table's expectations to create a new table that contained our cleaned data. We do some renumbering or some sorting, whatever. We clean the data. And then we use the records from the clean data table to make a Delta Live Table queries that create derived data sets. So let's have a look at this. The first we look at Python. Python is easy. Data scientist, easy way we are at here. We import everything we need. We ingest the raw clickstream data. You see it is a simple command. You, know, you clean and repair the data. You have a with column renamed, with column renamed, and you select command. And then you have simple here, define top spark refers. You read it, you filter it, you sort it, you select it, you have a limited presentation, easy as it can be. And the same for a data analyst, of course, in SQL, but you see the same functionality, the same process, the same input, the same outcome. So isn't this great? We know the Delta Lake. The next step is Unity Catalog. Of course, if you have, as in a company, this huge cloud data lake with all your public, secret, semi-secret data, you have to control access to the sensible data in your company. Unity ca Catalog is a unified governance solution for all data and AI assets. So we are talking here about also about models, about whatever you put, whatever you, you created on new AI models, machine learning models, whatever you trained on, files, tables, machine learning models, dashboards, anything you have in your lake house on any cloud, you have Google Cloud, AWS or Microsoft, it runs on all three platforms and you define the access policies once at the account level and enforce it across all workspaces. It is done for you. You do not have to care about this. So you have your data analyst, you have your data engineer and your data scientist, and they all have access to the diff to a Delta Lake, data lake, to the metadata, to the warehouse, to machine learning models, dashboards, whatever. You can really structure here beautifully access policy. Great. Now, of course, competition is something beautifully and maybe currently in November 2022, Apache Iceberg is, is some trending topic. Why? Because Google included it in its new Big Lake. Now, you know uh, that Databricks called it the Delta Lake and Google calls it the Big Lake because it has the big query. So you understand where the name comes from. And what is it? It is a combined data lake and a warehouse. An Apache Iceberg, Apache Foundation, an open table format for analytic data sets. And now in November, we have version one, version 1 1.0. It is finally officially here. And they included it in Google's new data lake, uh, big lake, sorry. What is Iceberg? A high performance format for huge analytical tables brings the reliability and simplicity of SQL tables, you see again SQL, to the big data, to the petabyte and exabyte, while making it possible for engine like Spark, you see completely connected to the, let's say the first or the forerunner here in this in topic, Flink, Presto, Hive, Impala, to work safely with the tables at the same time. Of course, Iceberg is a direct competitor to Databricks Delta Live Tables, or you can say, they have a perfect synergy. You can use both if you want on Google's platform. What else? Yeah, if you look here at the documentation Apache Iceberg, you see first you have Spark, everything you can do, Iceberg, Spark, and everything with Flint, Hive, Trini, Presto, Amazon Athena, Amazon EMR, Impala. You see, it is completely intertwined, interconnected, beautiful. And I think this is already more than I wanted to tell you. Yeah, Iceberg supports the schema evolution changes. You can add, drop, rename, update, record. Beautiful, beautiful. Everything is okay. But this was just an outlook. If you want to try to understand the evolution from a warehouse in SQL to the need of a lake house with Spark in currently November 2022, 
This was a short story 4000 years ago. It started with a warehouse in SQL and today I think it definitely brings you some benefits if you or your company or the team you work with try out the architecture of a lake house from Databricks. This video is not sponsored by Databricks. I just think that the idea and the concept and the clarity and the performance is there. But of course, if you now ask, hey, this is interesting. We just learned about the new hardware infrastructure in the three clouds with the NVIDIA H100, the Hopper architecture, and Google's TPU version 4, and also the, the transformer engine on NVIDIA, and now, and they clustered in their super pods, and now we have Spark also on a multi cluster and Spark runs on those three cloud, and this is the hardware infrastructure. How does Spark behave to TensorFlow or JAX or to PyTorch? Now, this is an interesting topic, and maybe in my next video, I show you how Google integrates Spark now in its own cloud services compared to PyTorch and in JAX, especially if you have an XLA compiler for cloud performance, cloud functionality, and the new services Google and maybe AWS thing they can offer to their companies. But this is completely topic of a new video. I say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit. It was a little bit of a new style to go back in history and try to explain something not on the latest technological documentation, but trying to understand the main concept of a lake house. Thank you, and I see you in the next.